Hi, right, my name is Jeff Davis. Uh, I'm a research entomologist for the LSU Ag Center. Today I'm going to talk about biology and control of stink bugs and soybeans. Uh, originally, I grew up in Wisconsin. I grew up on a dairy farm, and uh, we rarely sprayed or treated for any kind of insects. Now, in soybeans in Wisconsin, it's mainly soybean aphid. Uh, I did my research and I moved to LSU, and that's where I've been doing work for the past eight years. So we're going to talk about stink bugs. Uh, as you guys know, as producers, costs are really important, especially this year as we get closer to uh, lower values. And uh, we've been doing a lot of research uh, over the years as a group. And here, just looking at soybean insect losses from Alabama all the way to Virginia. And within those states, we uh, harvested over 527 million bushels. And we had 22 million lost to insects. So still pretty significant loss. Uh, average yields was about around 49 bushels, and average sprays for insects 1.4, 1.5. And that varies between the different states. Of course, in Louisiana, we usually budget uh, somewhere around three insect applications for stink bugs. Good morning. And uh, this is showing our economic value. So if you look at the cost of the foliar insecticides, the seed treatments, the scouting costs, the total costs, total cost put loss over uh, $500 million for insects itself. So about $44 an, uh, an acre really is what the value of what you're putting out. And out of our three top three insect pests, of course, corn earworm, pretty prevalent. I'm sure you guys have a lot of corn earworm in your fields. Stink bugs, second most important pest, and then soybean looper. And these are all interrelated. If we're trying to control our stink bugs, we may use some pyrethroids, especially for green stink bugs. Uh, that's going to flare any loopers that you get in there because our soybean looper are resistant to uh, pyrethroids. So they're all interconnected, all tied. When we go out and do those controls, we're also affecting the other insects out there. In terms of loss of less cost of control uh, for stink bugs itself in these states, anywhere from 47 million to 89 million. You guys told me stink bugs, green stink bugs, important. If you look at the species composition, and we need to know what stink bugs there are, which ones are there. Uh, greens, most prevalent throughout all these states, really are the number one problem. Um, for us in Louisiana and Texas, red banded stink bugs, still most important pest that actually makes up about 65% of what we catch and it's just a more damaging pest. But overall, understanding what you have in your field is going to determine what you're going to use to control. We're going to talk about it in greens, highly susceptible to most insecticides you're using. Others, like the browns, a little more, they need a little more insecticide, different products to use, and a little harder to control. Jeff, question. Sure. Do you mind? No, no problem. Um, you probably may be going to show this, but what's the range of the red banded in the south? Oh, I mean, so. I missed a minute of your. That's okay. Slide. No, I'm, I will talk about it in a little bit. But okay. I'll give you, uh, so red banded stink bug uh, arrived in Louisiana in 2000. It's been around the United States and Georgia and South Carolina since the 1960s, but it's never been really of a problem. All of a sudden, it arrives in Louisiana in 2000. By 2002, it's in two-thirds of the parishes, and it's causing some economic loss. By 2006, you're into the southern parts of Arkansas, parts of Mississippi. By 2009, it made it all the way up to uh, the Boot Hill region of Missouri, parts of Tennessee. Then in 2010, 2011, 2012, we've had some cold winters. And those populations have all essentially been eradicated from those areas and pushed all the way back down into primarily Texas and Louisiana. Now, populations have been slowly working their way up. Uh, back north, 2014, Mississippi, uh, somewhere around 20 to 30 percent of their sink bugs was red bandits. So it's getting back up there. This year, of course, it's been warm. The warmer it is, uh, the better those stink bugs survive over and over winter. So. Red band, it's still important, and it could move all the way back up. If we continue to have a warm year, and if there's a lot of stink bugs, they're going to get moved around, and they're just going to be able to increase their uh, populations forward north. Um, stink bug species to identify. We have our uh, nymphs of the different species. Mazera virigia is your southern green stink bug. It resembles very closely your green stink bug. Essentially, our growers when they're going out and scouting or our scouts, they combine the two, they call them, you know, they're greens. Browns, it's just a service you guys were talking about, you mentioned earlier. Uh, that's our common brown. 
Eushistus quadrator is becoming more prevalent. It has these sharp spines on this pronotum. Uh, we didn't have it about 10 years ago in Louisiana for some reason, probably due to global climate change, probably the same reason that red-banded sink bugs are increasing. This thing is increasing as well, and it's marching its way northward as well. It is a little harder to control than your just a service. So when we do put out applications, that thing is the only thing around as well as the red-banded stink bug. So that's also increasing its movement forward because we're not killing it off as well as we should. Of course, you've heard about brown marmorated, uh, more of an east coast pest. Uh, been some sightings in the mid-south, but not a lot. Uh, red-banded stink bug, Pisiodorus, it has this band. And I often get questions, what about, it's, it's the same as this one, right? No, this is the red-shouldered stink bug, Thianta species. This is pretty common throughout most of the soybean growing area. You can find it in Ohio, uh, parts of Wisconsin. Uh, Red-banded stink bug, though, is a neotropical species, likes it warm. If temperatures get below freezing for more than, say, four to seven hours consistently, uh, for each one of those hours, you're going to see about a 5% decrease in the population. So we need freezing temperatures, so pray for cold weather. Uh, ways to identify, besides the fact that if you're kind of used to looking at them, they do look different. The red bands here are more on the shoulders, where instead the red banded, it's across. Uh, but if you flip it over, this is the underside of the stink bug, very close up here, it's eyes. This is its proboscis, its stylet mouth parts that it actually pokes into your soybean, into your pods, and that's what it's feeding on in the beans. It has this little no, uh, little uh, spine that you can use for that identify. The reason we're concerned about the red-banded stink bug, it's harder to kill. Uh, it seems to reproduce a lot faster than your other stink bugs. It has deeper seed penetration, so it causes its style of mouth parts, even though it's a smaller insect, it can feed its mouth parts in farther into the bean pod, farther into the seed. Enzyme activity, these stink bugs don't have chewing mouth parts, they're piercing sucking mouth parts. So what they do is they pierce the pods, pierce the, uh, the beans itself, inject enzymes, just like we use spit, they're using spit, that dissolves those beans and then they slurp it up just like a big old slurpee, okay? Uh, they also have larger food and salivary canals. In other words, those little stylet mouth parts, think of it as uh, southern green stink bugs. If you have a, a little juice box, that's the kind of straw they have. Red-banded stink bugs, their straw is much thicker and bigger, and they can actually expand it wider. So they're causing more physical damage. There are other stink bug species. This is a black species, Croxus. Uh, very Jeff, before you leave that, I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, the red shoulders, it's not as nasty as the red bag. The red-shouldered stink bug, not as nasty. Yep. Uh, easier to control, doesn't cause as much damage. Still causes some damage. It still causes some damage. All stink bugs will feed, they'll all cause a little damage on the pods. It's just that depending on where they're feeding and where they're moving and how much are they going to actually, uh, the enzymes and that physical structure, they're actually causing damage to the pods and into the seeds. Uh, some of our stink bugs are not bad. This is a brown species, Podysis, the spine soldier bug. It's actually using its style of mouth parts to feed on other stink bugs. So not all browns are bad. Uh, kudzu bug, you've heard a little bit about. Some people think that's a stink bug. It's not. It's different. Uh, it's smaller, uh, different. It's closely related, but it's a foliar, or I mean, it, it's feeding on the phloem. It's feeding on stems and leaves. It's not feeding on the pods. And we do get uh, Koreids or leaf-footed bugs, which also feed on pods too, but they're a really rare pest. So we're going to focus in on those stink bugs themselves. What do they do? Yeah, and feel free to interrupt me. Uh, what do they do? They, they reduce yield and quality. That's really our main concern, right? And you can have some pods here. These have been fed by and fed on by stink bugs. You can see that here we have a, uh, a seed that hasn't been fed on. This one was fed as it was just at R3 or R4 stage, growth stage of the beans. And you can see that it's shriveled up. Uh, if feeding does occur, it opens a little hole in those. And anytime you puncture that bean, you puncture that pod, you're opening up for plant pathogens to come in. So Phomopsis, uh, other uh, fungal and bacterial pathogens can move in and cause some real damage as well. Here's some examples. How much of a yield loss can you see? This is with red-banded stink bugs at two per 25 sweeps for three weeks. 
Delta Grow 55, 65 bushels per acre. Just two stink bugs for 25 sweeps, and when we're scouting, we saw a 15 bushel per acre reduction. So protected, we used uh, acephate, or uh, we used uh, to control. We had two applications uh, included also with it a pyrethra. In terms of not only is it causing that bushel reduction, what's really going on? As I said, you get small seeds, right? So they'll either go back out the end, you're gonna have smaller seed weight too. And so you can have a real reduction in 100 seed weight, which is important when you get to the, uh, when you're going to sell. Uh, damage, here we have zero stink bugs. Again, more of a visual. Here's three stink bugs for 25 sweeps. Our threshold is four stink bugs for 25 sweeps, but not for three weeks. So even when you have lower than threshold, you still have this cumulative damage. So even if you're going out and you're scouting and you don't see where you're at your actual action, action threshold, if you're close and you've been close for a couple weeks, you can have damage forming. And that's the real thing that's really, I think, hurting a lot of growers is you have some out there, you have a few, but you don't think you have that many. So what's the cost of actually putting out an application? And in, in, this, in, in 2016 with our beans, at lower prices, we have to be conservative in terms of what applications and when we need to, get, need to get out. But you can have that damage occurring, really getting damaged when you get six per 25 sweeps. You're starting to see that cercostra, that purple uh, seed stain, a lot of damage and cracked pods. And then you, no one wants to see this in their field where you have lots of uh, small seeds and lots of secondary infection from plant pathogens. Here's a lot of seed phomopsis in this one. Uh, it also causes reduced germination, so if you're growing soybean for soybean seed to sell, that could be an issue, and delayed maturity. All right, have you guys seen a lot of problems with stay green or green stem, green pods? Have you had a lot of problems the last couple of years? Uh, some in our area have had problems. Uh, I wish we could see a little better. All this field, these are all research plots, we're all planted at the same time. Some have been harvested, others are getting ready to harvest, others are still staying green. What's happened, they're ready, it's been 120 days, we're ready to cut those beans. But what's happened is we've put out insecticide applications to control stink bugs in some of these, and others we haven't at all. So when you get at that threshold, that economic action threshold, you can have a lot of damage to that plant. If you have a lot of damage to the plant, how is it gonna react? It's gonna try to produce either reflower, it's gonna put out more pods, where it's gonna to try to stay green and fill those pods. And in fact, in Louisiana, where we rarely get a frost, uh, in some years we have, don't, these will stay green throughout the year, stink bugs will be in them feeding, it's a total loss. I've tried to run the combine through, and I broke the combine. So you're not gonna be able to harvest. What do you see in your seeds? This is what you look like, this is what you would harvest anyway. It's, it's, wholly, it's a horrible situation. So important in controlling your stink bugs. Now, this stay green is not just from stink bugs itself, it can also be from stress. Any kind of stress, any abiotic stress, such as drought, too much rain, you can have the same effect, but it's really variety dependent, and your seed growers should be, or seed uh, growers should be able to tell you which have more of a chance to be that delayed maturity. Uh, once again, same kind of thing where we sprayed and controlled stink bugs, same variety, here we did. That's what your field looks like. What are you going to do to control your stink bugs, right? The first thing we need to do is monitor and sample. Here we have some beans. These were ready to harvest, and you still got your red banded stink bug feeding on those beans. You got to get out. When are they active? And essentially, your stink bugs are active all year round. They're just feeding on different hosts. This time of year, they're going to almost like a torpor when it gets a little colder than below freezing. They're staying in the duff layer, like in the leaves, they're around any of your clovers, any kind of weedy plants that they're going to be. And as soon as it warms up, just like if you're a snake or you're a lizard, it's, you're going to go out and sun themselves. They want to warm themselves up. They're cold-blooded species. They need heat to be able to function. So they'll crawl up on the plants, feed, and they'll go back under. As we move throughout the season then, uh, they're going to be, the browns specifically are going to be found very often on your wheat as soon as, and then they're going to be in the clovers. Uh, tobacco and corn, I would also add cotton at this point. This is an older uh, slide from 1980. Uh, tomatoes, soybeans, when are they going to be? 
They're in your soybeans as soon as they start getting to that R2, R3 stage. As soon as those pods start forming, those stink bugs move in. Where have they been hanging out beforehand? In all the other crops. Southern greens and green stink bugs, they're gonna be in your corn, they're gonna be in your cotton. As soon as those, especially your corn starts drying down, where do they go? They come running to your beans because they're just looking for a food source. Red-banded stink bug, on the other hand, Pisiodorus, only a legume feeder. So it's gonna be found in your clovers, and as soon as those beans are up and up out of the ground, you're gonna start seeing them in there. Are they doing any damage yet? No. They're only doing damage as soon as those pods start forming. But for the red-banded stink bug, it needs a legume to feed on. So what we've been telling our growers is if you do have clovers, white clover or whatever around your field, mow it down and keep it mowed down. Uh, in Louisiana, our Department of Transportation has planted lots of crimson clover all along the roadsides. It's a beautiful plant. However, it is a great stink bug host. It's almost like stink bug crack. They go after that, they'll feed on it, and the populations just build up. And as soon as those guys go to mow that down, right around you know March, April, where are they going? They're moving into your fields or finding some place to go to get in. Okay? So scout, when you're scouting, you're gonna be scouting at that reproductive stage. So uh, just when are they causing economic losses? Here I've listed three-cornered alfalfa hopper, kudzu bug, uh, soybean looper for our stink bugs. It's really that R3 through that R8. I showed you that picture earlier. They will feed on those hard beans. Are you seeing any quality loss at that point? No. What you're seeing though is still seed weight loss. How are you going to monitor? Uh, if you guys don't know uh, and you don't have one, get out there and monitor yourself. If, even if you're paying for someone. Usually what we're using is a sweep net. For most of our stink bugs, nine stink bugs per 25 sweeps or one stink bug per row foot, you can use the shake sheet. You're just sitting there, bending the plants over, shake off and count the number of stink bugs. Here with the sweep net, who's used the sweep net before? Yeah, you guys can see. I don't have to tell you, you know what to do. Identify, I was talking about before, it's important to identify our species hey, because, yep. Question. Um, is it true like a good rainfall basically bringing out the predatory fungi that kind of knock back the population? Is that Yep. Kind of what happens in the dry periods that stink bugs need to build up. Yes. Uh, so we're going to talk about it, but entomopathogens, uh, just like anything else, stink bug. All insects actually get will have a fungal pathogen, bacterial pathogens. I'll check the time too. I don't want to go over. <laughs> um, but they do. Yes. So dry conditions, those pathogens, they'll get something called Bavaria bassiana. It's a fungal pathogen. Dry conditions, uh, fungi fungus doesn't grow. And in fact, a lot of the, what we're putting out to control our cercospora and other funguses in our soybeans actually controls that as well. So by putting out controls that we need for our soybeans, we're actually limiting the amount of uh, fungus that will actually attack our stink bugs. So it's kind of a, it's that risk. You know, you want the natural enemies, you want the diseases to kill your insects, but you don't want those diseases that are killing your soybeans to increase. So you've got to control those, but you're controlling the... the the good ones as well. I did uh, consult your identification keys. Uh, there's lots of them out there. APS just put out a new soybean diseases, diseases and pests. All your states produce those. Uh, some are online. I'll put a plug in for LSU Ag Center. Uh, we do have our weed, insect, and disease field guide uh, 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 funded by our Soybean and Grain Research and Promotion Board. It's online. Uh, there's also paper copies that has good identification keys for all the stink bug pests. And because our controls are based on what we find. So if we do, we find out what, we count the number of bugs that we have, which ones we have, red-banded 16 bugs per 100 sweeps, and then we're going to follow our guidelines. We can do nothing, sample again, or we're going to put out some kind of tactic. Why are we doing nothing? Pests could be below economic or injury level. They're not causing that much damage, especially our action thresholds are actually supposed to increase the lower the price is, if it's truly that. Though our action thresholds are pretty static. Our crop, you know, soybeans can, can uh, tolerate a lot of injury. We don't need to be controlling them just as we see that first insect. You really want to get to where it's going to cause some kind of economic level. And maybe by spraying a bunch of times, we're actually, it's kind of costly. Costly in terms of money, costly in terms of we're increasing resistance. 
If it tells you that you don't have enough and you got to sample again, it's below the action threshold, populations aren't increasing, and if they continue to be static and actually decreasing, you may not have to put out anything. And of course, you're going to use a tactic when your populations are increasing, they're at the threshold, and then you guys get to decide what you're going to use. Okay, we're going to talk about different tools and tactics now to kind of finish up. Any questions about what I've gone through before? Important to identify what you have out there. All right, control options, insecticides. That's what we're using, most of us are doing. We're following, we're sampling, and then we're putting out our insecticides at our timely uh, fashion. It's important to identify, as I said before, greens and southern greens, a lot easier to control, a lot of success. It's actually harder to control the nymphs of those species than it is the adults. Why that is, uh, part of it is they just have a lot more, uh, they're still growing, they have a lot more uh, fat body. I have a lot of fat body. Uh, they have a lot of fat body that helps them get rid of a lot of the insecticides. They're just tougher to control. Your browns, much more difficult than say your greens and southern greens. And our red banded stink bugs are just hardest, hardest to control. Here's some examples of field efficacy that we've produced uh, two and seven days after control. Your pyrethroids, you got your southern greens, and your red bandits. Uh, southern greens, greens are just easier to control with the pyrethroids, organophosphates. And in general, the neonicotinoids by themselves have not worked very well. And that's why all, all of them are, are not registered as single products for soybean. In other words, you can't use centric that you would use on your cotton, which is cyamethoxan. It's not registered for soybean. Uh, what it is, is it's a premix, which we'll talk about. But organophosphates here, your acetate works very well, has worked very well consistently, and is actually the best product for our red banded stink bugs. Uh, tank mixes or premixes, uh, lambdas, uh, your karate warrior with your thymethoxan, you guys would know that as centric, uh, cyfluthrin and imidacloprid, and then your cyfluthrin and acetate. And that's really given us the tank, tank mix of an acetate plus a pyrethroid has really given us the control for red banded stink bugs. But in general, for southern greens, green stink bugs, if that's what you have on your farm, that's going to be the easiest to control of those pyrethroids. What do you guys, what do you have on your farm, mainly? What kind of stink bugs? Me? Yes. Green. Green? Yeah, I'm, I'm in Missouri. So yeah, yeah you're, you're all green. It's really more green. Yeah. Time. Yeah, and the greens are just more tolerant. The reason Arkansas, Missouri, you're seeing a lot of greens in all the other states, uh, it's just, they're more cold town. They've been here longer. They've just done. Uh, you guys? Green. Greens? Okay. So easy to control. Yes. Yep. Uh, for uh, the LSU Ag Center, uh, even though we have greens and southern greens, we're red bandits, we recommend budgeting at least three stink bug applications. That's different than what you guys are going to budget. We have to budget that much because if we don't budget that and control this thing, we don't get any beans. <laughs> So we do budget that, and that's hard to budget when, we're got, when we have uh, lower costs that we're having right now. And, but we want you to rotate because we don't want resistance. So what are you going to do? Uh, if you use an acephate, you want to come back. You don't want to use acephate again necessarily. You want to use a pyrethroid. You don't want to use neonix with um, all of them together. Some growers do combine in our area, combine all three products, and that's driven resistance, and I'm going to show you that in a little bit. I often get asked, what am I going to use? Uh, you know, your choice is, if you use a pyurethroid, uh, specifically used if you're using bifenthrin, you know, you got your pre-harvest intervals, you want to make sure that you're following those. Uh, but bifenthrin, you can't apply a second application unless you've had 30 days. So say you use bifenthrin and you're trying to control your bean leaf beetles, you got some uh, velvet bean caterpillars, some green clover worm, or something like that, and you want to control your stink bugs, after that application, you're going to have to wait 30 days. So you got to be careful. Your, uh, like your lambda, cyhalthrin, uh, thymethoxin, that's your indigo. You got 30 days you got to wait before you can harvest. Clothianidin, that's belay, uh, 21 days. See, the reason acephate is great is because, you know, 14 days, we can put it out there late. Uh, are you guys using harvest aids? Are you putting out like paraquat or something for, yeah. Um, if you're putting out that, you've got to wait 15 days, right? Uh, so the acephate works well. Uh, we've had a problem with acephate at a half pound rate. We have resistance to red band and stink bug. So your choices are, you know, depending on when you're going to harvest. And 
here's just an example. This is from our 2015 efficacy trial of how bad those red banded stink bugs can be. As I said, this red bar is the threshold. We had over as high as 55 for 25 sweeps. You know, I mean, that's 13, 14 times threshold, right? Uh, this was in the rice growing area uh, near Crowley, near the rice research station. Huge populations. Where are they coming from? Someone else is probably soybeans as we were getting ready to harvest. Uh, nothing worked at all except for venom. Venom is uh, dinotefiran and is not labeled for soybeans, but we threw it in there because it does work very well against stink bugs in general. Uh, the acephate, here's that half pound rate of orthene. Look at the variability. You could have as many as almost 28 stink bugs for 25 sweeps, or you could get down closer to 10. That's that resistance. And once you get resistance, you don't want to have it because it's going to stick around. Here's kind of our red banded stink bug acephate resistance. We started monitoring back in 2005. The concentrations to control 50% of the population were below 2.5 uh, parts per million. All I want you to know is that it's increased dramatically. Why? 2010, cold winter. All the populations that were alive were probably resistant to begin with. And when it's a cold and you don't have anyone else to mate with, you're going to mate with resistant, resistant, right? You guys know about resistance management. They're mating and they're both resistant. They survive. We had another cold period and it just has bumped and walked its way up. You don't want it in your area. Once you guys get it, it doesn't disappear. Uh, we've tried various things. We've tried having growers switch out of acephate, not using it at all. The problem is everyone likes using acephate. It's cheap. It works well against your worms, right? It works well against a lot of things. And unfortunately, <coughs> we still see this resistance building. We don't even re recommend half pollen per acre. So we want to use insecticides, but we got to reduce insecticide use. What can we do? We can do border sprays. And we've tested, we know stink bugs aggregate along the edges initially in the year. Why? Because they're coming in from somewhere else. They're going to be in these, these areas. Uh, they could be in your turn rows, it could be on the edges, whatever. But what if we sprayed only those edges? Can we control our stink bugs? Here's just an example. This is a heat map for stink bugs. Wherever it's brighter is where they're coming in from. They're coming in from it, cotton, coming in from corn. This is a 25 acre uh, section that we were sampling weekly. And you can see they're then bleeding into your field as, they, your, as the year progresses. And still, though, some areas don't have any stink bugs. Can we do those border treatments or perimeter treatments? We can. We can get very good control. We can keep them below our threshold. We also, by spraying the border, we can, only the border, we want to conserve natural enemies. Uh, Kelly was just telling us, you know, we talked about entomopathogens. Uh, some of the other natural enemies, other insects that control stink bugs, we have egg parasitoids. These are related to, these are wasps. So wasps like uh, yellow jackets and other things that you have around the house. These are very small. They'll actually parasitize stink bug eggs. And they do a great job of controlling those. However, they're highly susceptible, just like bees, right? You, you know, all in the news, you hear about all our insecticides that we use kill the bees, and so we're going to get rid of the insecticides, right? Well, that's not going to help us grow our soybeans. However, it is to be aware that those insecticides also kill off those parasitoids that are doing a great job of controlling stink bug eggs. Uh, entomopathogens, we talked about fungi, uh, fungi bacteria, uh, nematodes. This is a nematode that is erupting out of a uh, stink bug. So just like the movie Aliens, right? You guys have seen that maybe. Yeah, I know. Uh, the nematode is coming and is fed inside that stink bug and is now erupting out of that. All the spaghetti is that nematode. And you'll see anywhere from 2 to 10% of your population uh, being controlled by these nematodes. Once again, dependent on uh, weather. Uh, they really like rain. They're found in the soil. So if you get more splash up into your canopy of your soybeans, you're going to get more of these in your sink bugs. Trap cops, right? An old way of trying to control. This is nothing new. But if we want to reduce the amount of insecticides going out, we've got to be able to... Uh, and that we want to reduce because of insect because of resistance and we just want to put less product we can use trap crops various trap crops have been proposed sorghum uh, other people have used buckwheat and field pea 
sunflowers. If these fit into your production, sure, but are you going to be able to harvest these? No, you're not going to get anything out of it. But you are providing support for those natural enemies. Uh, McPherson and Newsom at LSU used soybean as their trap and main crop, and they were able to hold southern green stink bugs in just 10% of their field. Problem is, most people don't use them because they're species specific. Often planted at times that aren't at the main crop, right? You guys are going out to plant your field, you want to get it planted. You're not going to come back and leave space to plant your trap crop later. Some aren't harvestable. Work in Arkansas actually used it with the early soybean production system, used a maturity group three, which was planted six weeks before the group five, it didn't work, okay? However, we've tested using that same group three, but planting at the same time as your group five, right? I, if I'm, I grew up on a farm, my dad doesn't want to go back out to that field right away after he's planted. So the idea was, you're gonna plant these group threes along the edge, right, taking advantage of that perimeter treatment. We can also enhance that perimeter treatment by using these group threes. Why group threes? They're gonna emerge out of the ground at the same time as your fives, but they're gonna pod anywhere from one week to two weeks before your group fives. And those pods form, those stink bugs are gonna go in there and they're gonna stay in there. That was the hope. And then if you need to spray, you can just spray that track crop to get rid of them instead of spraying your whole field. Long story short, number of stink bugs for 25 sweeps throughout the season. Group five is a square. We never got above anywhere above one stink bug per 25 sweeps. The trap crop, however, got very high. We could spray those, bring the population down. They'd increase, spray them again. And so we were able to protect three quarters of our field by just using 25% of it and spraying that. Post plant resistance. A lot of work coming out of the United Soybean Board is funding a lot of research that for my group that we're looking at, host plant resistance. Soybeans, as I said before, uh, very malleable. They can handle a lot of damage. We've looked at screening different breeding lines, and we're looking for cumulative insect days. Here is just stink bug populations throughout time and percentage damage. And the reason we're looking at both is this. If we look at populations, most of you guys don't plant the same variety on all your acreage, right? You're planting multiple varieties. You want to be able to harvest at different times. You can't get seed of everything. So what you don't want to have is a population or a, a variety that has high populations. Why? That's, that supports high populations. Because once you go down and you put out your harvest aid and you're ready to, uh, you're going to combine, you don't want that those soybean or those stink bugs moving from one field to the next field to the next field. Now, if you don't like your neighbor, you may want to move it into his field, but if in general, you don't want to move into your fields. So you want to find a variety that has low populations. However, you don't want a lot of damage. So here we have this NC Roy. It's available. It's a uh, variety. Very low stink bug populations throughout the year, but very high damage. What you want is something that's going to give you very little damage. I know there's a lot of damage in here. We had a lot of stink bugs that year. What you want is something like this, which has low populations, low damage. <coughs> what about current soybean varieties? We test a lot of those. Uh, working with Dr. Ronnie Levy, our uh, state agronomist, we pick out the highest yielding ones, and each year we test those in a sprayed and unsprayed setting. So here are commercial available varieties. And you're going to see a difference in bushels per acre. So those in blue, that's great, right? Some of them, and what this shows is there's a high range of susceptibility to almost resistance in those varieties. If you look at these, this Dynagro and Taro, it probably wasn't worth your insecticide application to save you only one bushel, right? Meaning compared sprayed versus unsprayed, we sprayed twice, unsprayed, very close. What it does is, with your Delta Grow 5625, you better be controlling your stink bugs. And so it really is, the, it shows you the variability in these beans that are out there. These Whoop. are all in the same field, yep. Jim. Huh? These are all in the same field. Yeah, these are all in the same field. These were just split plots, side by side. Uh, these were half acre blocks for each of these, and this is what we ended up with. Uh, in other 24, 2014, 2015, <coughs> these are the varieties we're using. Here I'm showing you a little different. You still get your response, but I'm looking at the cost of the application. So two applications, 
ten dollars uh, a crack per bushel or per acre. So twenty dollars. Here's current or was at that point when I was uh, calculating this out. And what are your savings? So once again, a lot of variability within current varieties. Even though they're yielding all relatively the same, a lot of variability where this Asgrow 4934, if that's your favorite variety, make sure you're putting out, that saved you $173, $174. If this Hornbeck 4721, you only saved yourself $2.36 a bushel. So what it shows is there is a lot of resistance out there trying to capture that and trying to get that for the commercial seed producers is going to be difficult because as you guys know, you could have a variety for one year, you could have a variety for five years. What I do is I buy three, four, five, ten bags of each and I just plant them out them myself. But I keep enough so that I can do it at least two years for replicated trials. So what are we going to do for stink bugs? Know your species. Know that you're, if you're going to use insecticides, be aware that resistance can form. How can you reduce resistance? Try out their cultural techniques. Trap crops, perimeter sprays, and you know, host plant res resistance is out there. We're creating publications, <coughs> excuse me, that we release each year for our growers in Louisiana that recognize and look at these different varieties. Now we get over 500 varieties in our official variety trials. I can't do all the testing on those. It takes a lot of work just to do this and to do seed. We also evaluate for seed damage. Um, we're still going to be evaluating that damage up until the point that we're going to be planting in March. So it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. Use, if you can, host plant resistance. They wor it works well if you're insecticides. And all those others can work well. Conserve your natural enemies. And with that, if you guys have any more questions, I'll answer them. I just want to thank Louisiana Soybean and Grain Research and Promotion Board, United Soybean Board, for all the funding for all this research. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> I hope you guys learned something. Yes. All right, any questions? I was telling me about Gray Looper and the Boot Hill. How bad is that compared to Soybean Looper? Uh, so Gray Looper would be Cabbage Looper, or rack, or is it a different? I don't know. Uh, you know Monine? Yes, I know Monine. So yeah. Monine uh, found them last year. Okay. And all I know is Gray Looper. I really don't know. Be so it's, uh, it's probably a Racaplusia. I think there's a Racaplusia species. If that's the one, it's early season, and then they kind of just fade away, and then they can show up late season. Uh, but it should be pretty easy to control as far as I know. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. okay. She was so, about them, yeah. Soybean looper, on the other hand, though closely related, much more difficult to control. We've uh, This talk wasn't about, about it, but sure. we even this year had... Um, resistance to the diamide, so your belt and Prevathon. Oh. So okay. it showed up pretty bad this year. Okay. So be aware. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I have a question on the stink bug. Sure. Though. Now, those results you had, that was primarily all red banded, right? Or yep. Were, uh, uh, three quarters of the population red banded. Do you see, maybe not to its ex extent, but do you see uh, the varietal differences with uh, green stink bug as well? Yeah, so 2014 was uh, mainly greens for us that year. Mm -hmm. And same response. Mm -hmm. So it almost, re resistance to one stink bug, it seems in a lot of these, is probably providing resistance to multiple species. And that's probably because it's not a single trait. You know, like your nematode resistance is usually less like one gene or two genes. This is probably many genes, a quantitative trait loci, working together to give you that resistance. So some of the resistance is less egg lay. They're not producing as many eggs in there. Uh, some is they just don't reproduce as fast. So all kinds of effects. And I came in when you were talking about the greenness of sure. the beans themselves. Yeah. But then is that much of the difference? I mean, some varieties have a yeah. tendency to be yes. on the greener side anyway. And yes. Then and then, so yes, uh, so talking back to that green stink, that delayed maturity green stem, green bean, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, some are highly sensitive. Like if a strong wind goes by, they seem to do it and stay green. Others are much more resistant. But if you have really high stink bug populations, no matter what, you're going to probably end up with it. So once again, picking varieties is important, not just for, you know, you pick it for your, for your diseases, you're going to pick it for your insects, and for the green bean syndrome is also important.
And if you guys didn't sign up, make sure you sign as you come in. Oh, but if you, that was for my talk. Yeah, for the next talk, uh, just wait. Don't sign that one. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. I appreciate it.